questions about an independent police accountability board. Welcome to those who want to find out more about an independent police accountability board. Welcome to those who are in support of an independent police accountability board. And welcome to those who may be critical of an independent police accountability board. Welcome everyone. We have with us today a phenomenal group of panelists who are sh here to share with us their experiences in the development of an independent police accountability board and to give us the history within Rochester and to let us know where we stand now. I want to thank the panelists who have come in as far away as California and to as close as a local church in Rochester. We have a fast and furious agenda for you today. In the tradition of the African American church, we'll, we will be passing around a basket for people to make a suggested donation of $10. All amounts are welcome. After the presentation and after the one question the facilitator will ask, with the questions, we will have questions from the audience. There will be a mic for you to come to ask a concise question, and the panelists will respond with one or two responses. We will start this forum with a brief overview of purpose, of why an independent police accountability board is so necessary. This purpose will be presented by Ted Forsyth. And an exemplary video will follow. This is a video that has not been seen before, but it is truly symbolic of why an independent police accountability board is so vital to the community health of Rochester, New York. I have to warn you, I did see the video. It is honest, it is true, and it is graphic. When I first saw it, I thought my stomach could not handle it, but it is what happens and it is reality. After we see the video, I will introduce um, the panelists and we will have comments. Ted, purpose. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Um, Scooch that up a little bit. Uh, we are experiencing a couple of technical difficulties, so uh, the videos are going to be shown, but they may not be shown exactly in the order you described. We'll either show them right before the panelists or right after, so we just want to keep you around longer on this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for coming today. Uh, I'm thrilled to see all of you here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what Enough is Enough is. Uh, discuss the origins of today's event, and then contextualize uh, the two uh, videos we're gonna show that Dr. Harrison alluded to. The work of, enough, of, the work of Enough is Enough is twofold. On the one hand, we accompany people going through, the current, uh, going through current criminal cases through the criminal justice system, uh, who've experienced police brutality, uh, ra racial profiling, um, and harassment by the Rochester Police Department. We offer emotional and tactical support, demystify the law, attend court proceedings, expose the misconduct of individual officers as well as the department with consent if applicable, and provide direct support such as uh, getting folks to appointments with uh, lawyers or getting them to court appearances. Uh, the other thing we do is we, we tend to build coalitions and work for a systemic change of how law enforcement does its work in Rochester. And those recommended changes come about through uh, personal testimonies and also through aggregate data uh, expressing police violence in our community. Enough is Enough has been an integral part of the campaign to educate the public on the Police Accountability Board. Our organization and over 85 other supporting organizations and affected individuals have moved on to the next chapter of this campaign, uh, namely passing the Police Accountability Board with substantive powers such as independent investigative authority, subpoena power, disciplinary power through a disciplinary matrix, and the power to make recommended uh, changes to RPD policy and procedure. 
The, experience, the experiences of systemic police violence, structural racism and poverty, degraded housing uh, stock, the red redlining, lack of jobs, uh, general indignities, uh, inadequate edu education, led many communities of color in the cities across the nation, including Newark and Rochester, to rebel against these oppressive conditions, the oppressive conditions that they faced. Race rebellions, and I use that word intentionally, consumed Rochester in July 1964 and Newark in July 1967. By rebellion, I mean an open and defiant resistance to government policy, unlike uh, a riot, which is a, a spontaneous, uh, uncoordinated um, act of violence. In 1966, uh, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense organized in Oakland, California, ostensibly to protect people of color from uh, uh, the racism and brutality of the Oakland Police Department. The struggle for racial, political, and economic justice continues today across this nation. Enough is Enough hosted four film, uh, four film screening events this past February and March. We began the series with Revolution 67 about the race rebellion in Newark, New Jersey. The narrative of the film was told by community members and activists who analyzed the racist systemic violence that caused the rebellion. One graphic used in the film conveyed the fact that there were over 500 similar rebellions around the country. It's a part of the history of the 1960s that is not uh, talked about often. Then we screened July 64 about the race rebellion here in Rochester, which occurred on Joseph Avenue, where this church is located, and Clarissa Street in the Cornhill neighborhood today. The narrative of this film was generally told more by people in power or previously in power, which had a strikingly, strikingly different tone than Revolution 67. Uh, there were critical voices, certainly, but the tenor of the film seemed to suggest that the rebellion was simply a black eye, we have to move on, otherwise we're a near perfect city and there's no problem here. We then showed Policing the Police, a documentary updating um, participant, event participants on what, occurred, what has occurred in Newark, New Jersey from 1967 to today. With a sympathetic city council, a mayor that came from um, com a community organizing background, uh, a movement for police accountability, and a Department of Justice investigation that found that the Newark Police Department engaged in a pattern and practice of unco unco unconstitutional stops, searches, arrests, use of excessive force, and theft by officers in violation of civilian constitutional rights. Uh, a Civilian Complaint Review Board was passed in 2006, giving the community substantial power to hold officers and the department accountable for their gross abuses. Last, we showed the force that looked at Oakland, that looked at Oakland's police department and the sex scandal that rocked it, uh, where uh, three successive police chiefs were ousted in a matter of nine days. Uh, this, no doubt, led the population of Oakland to demand immediate change. And in November of 2016, the electorate of Oakland passed a ballot measure approved by approximately 87% of the voters to create a civilian police commission, a cutting edge piece of legislation that granted community oversight of the police department, as well as disciplinary power to civilians on the commission. And that's where this series for about two months ended. Uh, I just want to say I'm really grateful to all the people, organizers, members of Enough is Enough community who have spread the word and uh, our panelists certainly, uh, Pastor Cherry here at the church, um, Max Brown who made our flyer, uh, you know, just all of the work that went into this event today, I'm just, I'm just stunned. I mean, we got, we got this great ad in the city newspaper, um, you know, there's just a lot, lot here. Um, and, you know, the people who continue and had new conversations about a very, very old problem in Rochester, New York. The purpose of this event today is for you to consider the possibilities of a police accountability system with substantive powers that have been passed in other cities. The purpose is to consider that each of us can add a voice and an action to bring about the change we want to see, uh, rectifying the current broken system. The purpose is to dream of a world where effective police accountability exists and create that world today. 
Victor Monterosa from Newark and Anthony Fennell from Oakland are here to give us some insight into these possibilities as their cities have passed police accountability ordinance that have the power and resources to work. The proposed police accountability board legislation here in Rochester and the demands that are at the core of it come directly out of the work of communities of color, black churches, and affected individuals that demanded passage of similar legislation for over 50 years. Several high profile and several thousands of unknown incidents uh, sparked and re-sparked and re-sparked again the demand for actual police accountability in Rochester. I forgot I don't have backs to my speech, excuse me. Um, so some of those sparks, I'm just gonna name some names here, are um, Rufus Farewell, A.C. White, Denise Hawkins, Alicia McCuller, uh, Kelvin Green, uh, Vandy Davis, Craig Hurd, Lawrence Rogers, um, Patricia Thompson, Hayden Blackman, uh, Israel Izzy Andino, and Richard Gregory Davis. We are so very close to this goal now today. Uh, the Police Accountability Board Alliance has urged publicly uh, and through speak to city council sessions that city council do the right thing, the moral thing, the just thing, and pass the legislation now. One of the things, that, uh, one of the things PAB advocates have been doing as of late is strategizing about how to move this fight forward. So I want to talk a little bit about concerns that people might be having. Let's say city councilors were concerned that the passage of the PAB would somehow strip them of their subpoena power. This concern is categorically false. Nothing in our proposed legislation takes away the ability of city council to have subpoena power. It does add subpoena power to a body that is overseen by city council. Or consider that councilors might have a fear of a lawsuit with the passage of this ordinance. We know that the Rochester Police Locust Club will file a lawsuit against anything more progressive than what is currently in place. Quite frankly, I'd be surprised if they didn't. It happened in 1963 against Rochester's first civilian review board, the Police Advisory Board. It's happened in other places like Newark, New Jersey, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, New York City, uh, Chicago, Illinois, and on and on and on. We know this is gonna happen. The city council should not be fearful of a lawsuit from the police. Instead, they should prepare for it and be encouraged by the diversity and desire of the people to, to push this through. Otherwise, if things don't change drastically, they can expect continued lawsuits from individuals who have experienced police violence. If council is concerned about funding the PAB, I'd ask them to look at how they funded the Body Warrant Camera Initiative. City Council found $2 million to pass that initiative in 2016. Our proposal demands five planks and about a million dollars. Seems pretty reasonable. When one considers that the Rochester Police Department budget hovers around $100 million a year. Perhaps councilors have a concern that the PAB does not have the legal authority to discipline officers under state law. This is also false, at least according to our interpretation. Council has yet to release the independent opinion they got on a PAB type board that could issue discipline. And speaking of discipline, the ordinance calls for a disciplinary matrix that would be formed from the consultations with the police department, the city, and the Locust Club. By the way, the matrix is a progressive, transparent, and equitable way of issuing justice that removes the uh, chief of police's discretion, removes favoritism from the equation, and, um, see, uh, to, and, and, and basically allows the people to review these cases and have a stake, have power over how those uh, sanctions, the, that discipline might look. Uh, finally, I can imagine that being a city councilor is ex an extremely distracted form of work. It's not the PAB. It's, uh, if it's not the PAB, then it's the tenants and their citywide tenants union demanding that the landlord, landlords be held accountable uh, for code violations of their properties. Or perhaps it's a need for low income housing and a resolution to the horrendous problem of homelessness in our cities. Perhaps they are distracted by the fight over parcel five or the precarious situation of residents of the Cobbs Hill village. I don't envy their position and yet I want justice. That said, we thought we try to get their attention back on the PAB. 
at this point, I was going to tell you about the videos and then show them, but I, we're not there yet. So I'll, t I'll give you a brief overview of the videos and we'll show them in a bit. Um, the first video is a two minute piece showing what happened to Catherine Bonner, uh, care of the Democratic Chronicle. Uh, RPD officer Corey McNeese convinced Ms. Bonner's ex to just break into the house. Uh, McNeese contravened both RPD policy and state law when he convinced the ex to break in. He said, you won't be held accountable. And only because of this court case is perhaps Corey McNeese being held accountable, but because of state law 50A, we have no idea if that's accurate or not. McNeese was also made aware of an alleged domestic violence incident that happened the night before. The incident was caught on tape the next day in November. Uh, McNeese disregarded the statement about the domestic violence incident with, um, from the night previous, as well as the fact that uh, Ms. Bonner's ex lived in Livonia. Uh, Judge Charles Ciano uh, su recently suppressed evidence against Ms. Bonner, and um, we applaud him for doing that. The second video is a five minute piece showing what happened to David Van. Uh, EIE, enough is enough, got the video from Van himself. David was handcuffed as he was beaten into unconsciousness. Two RPD officers, Drake and Kester, injured themselves as they beat Van, leading Van to be charged with two felony counts of assault on a police officer. David was kept in jail for over a month before he was released to his mother. He had a criminal trial. He refused to take a plea deal, and the jury found him not guilty of all charges. Yeah. So, unique, um, unique moment in judicialness, I guess. Um, that's not even a word. I apologize. <laughs> Just uh, last week, his attorney, his civil attorney, Ellie Dolby, Dolby Shields, filed a 130-page civil complaint alleging police brutality, violation of civil rights, a cover-up, and a pattern and practice of abuse in the Rochester Police Department for what happened to David. Again, if they're not scared of lawsuits uh, from people that are abused by the police, why would they be afraid of the police issuing a lawsuit? Sorry, I'm, I'm now riffing a little bit, excuse me. Uh, both videos are certainly traumatic and graphic. I consider this a warning. If you feel the need to step out and get some space, please do. We want to refocus. Both cases are absolutely egregious. This must stop. City Council must pass the Police Accountability Board now. Enough is enough. Thank you, Ted, for that informative overview of the enough is enough and the things that we are adamantly trying to do and to change. Now I'd like to turn this forum over to our panelists. Our panelists, as you can see, um, consists of four very well-informed, strong backgrounds, um, well-educated, well-involved activists. <laughs> they are, their bios are described in the flyer that was on the table. So what I would like to share with you is that what you have before you is a representation of what has occurred in the past, um, represented by Dr. Walker, what is going on now on the East Coast and West Coast, represented by Victor Monterosa and Mr. Anthony, Anthony Fennell, and lastly but not least, what is happening right now in Rochester for the very near future with Pastor Wanda Wilson. Dr. Walker, if you would like to begin, each panelist will have um, approximately 15 minutes to share your insights, and then we will go to questions. Thank you. Maybe the second one will be on. You can also use this one, it has a long cord. All right, good afternoon, everybody. 
It's uh, my pleasure uh, to be with you, uh, but especially to share the panel table with um, our other panelists. Uh, it's very good to know that we have, despite a long period of frustration and resistance, uh, we still have a lot of people on the firing line. And I think this represents fairly well what we have been attempting to do for a long time. My thoughts um, go out in appreciation of the work that um, Ted Forsyth and Barbara Lackaware have done. And um, we hope that all of us will be certainly benefited from this coming together. I have um, been in Rochester uh, 52 years. I came here in 1966 to go to graduate school and found myself, um, or I find myself still here. Uh, not that my luck has been bad in gaining employment, but um, I kind of like this area. Um, I've raised children here and have taught here and currently I'm pastoring here. And this is, though I'm from the Midwest, this is uh, what I consider home. Uh, when I came uh, to this city, the uprising, the rebellion, had occurred two years before. And like most of the central city uprisings that occurred in the 1960s, were really instigated by police, white police against black communities, poor communities specifically. In this city, poor and Latino communities because of the fact that they lumped uh, poor Hispanics and poor blacks together uh, right in the area where we are now so that the uprising that occurred here occurred just a block away uh, in the year 1964. Um, so when I came here, I became associated with the fight organization and they had been struggling against police oppression for a long period of time. Um, when I came, fight was only about uh, not quite two years old, uh, but already it had taken a position of defiance toward police uh, oppression in our community. Um, during the time that um, I was laboring with the organization, there were three major conflagrations between the police and the community, um, all of them within the poor black community. Talking around to brothers who had been here for a while and to some young ladies, it was generally agreed upon that the police were a negative presence in the black community because they served a role more as occupationary troops than protectors of the society. Um, they were vicious, they were racist, and they were brutal. The Rufus Farewell incident that occurred some years before I came certainly is indicative of the type of behavior that the police exercise among the poor. Uh, but there were some uh, terrible incidents of police violence that led to uh, mortalities. I'm thinking of Alicia McCullers murder. I'm thinking of the, the murder of Denise Hawkins. And I'm particularly um, concerned in terms of my own inabilities to address this issue enough was the murder of Calvin Green in 1988, who was a petty criminal running from the police. He was not armed. He ran into a house and took occupancy in a crawl space. 
The police came, ordered him down. He refused to come down because he feared coming down. And Officer Smith, a white officer, hit Calvin Green five times with bullets and causing his immediate death. But this, like all of the incidents of police brutality that were protested, including the killings, were all dismissed by a very impotent and controlled grand jury. We, as a result of the Calvin Green murder, uh, the United Church Ministry, to which I belonged under the leadership of Reverend Raymond Graves at that time, uh, thought that it would be good to put together a report demanding a civilian review board. That's what we called it, a civilian review board, which we did. It was 32 pages long, and we gave it to the mayor, who was Thomas Ryan, and we gave copies to every member of the city council. Only two city council persons took it. Uh, one was Latino and the other one was African American, uh, predictably. All the other members of the council were white persons. I doubt very serious if they read it, uh, but it was read by the other two who supported it. And as a result of that support, uh, we thought that we were at least heading into a situation that would be less frustrating than we had observed in the past. But the rare mayor, Mr. Ryan, did not even look at it. And as a result of the grand jury hearing on Calvin Green, again, the officer was excused. Nothing uh, illegitimate was found in his, uh, his uh, behavior at all. This frustrated us greatly a 32-page document that dealt with all of the aspects and elements of police control uh, that we could think of that would be legitimately addressed. Um, in addition to that, we dealt with recruitment and we dealt with some other aspects, including education of police officers uh, before they could obtain a shield uh, and a gun. But nonetheless, uh, despite what we felt was a quality offering in terms of a proposal was uh, shot down by the, uh, no pun intended, but was really rejected by the police. Um, the, for a lot of this, the, Thomas Hastings was the chief of police, um, followed by the man who was finally convicted of a felony himself and sent off to prison, incognito, of course. I have in my possession, number one, I have the statement just done by um, Mrs. Lacquerware and Mr. Forsyth, and I certainly do appreciate their efforts, but I have here a condensed version of the 1988 Civilian Review Board um, that um, has not at all adhere to much of what uh, has been stated. Um, I want to share with you, if I could, just from this document, uh, which is um, a brief on the proposal for a civilian review board for the city of Rochester Police Department, for the city should read. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, lead in this um, implementation. I won't share it all with you. This is just elements that we took from the original 1988 document. There's some things which we feel are yet uh, to be addressed and much of what we have put together in this uh, review, this survey from the 1988 document. For example, we had written that the general purposes of a civilian review board for the city of Rochester, New York, are to ensure the following. And we go down a list of um, alphabetical um, statements that we felt to be uh, very important and needed to be addressed. But just let me read one from you. It says that the CRB, or the Civilian Review Board, 
shall have the following powers, duties, and responsibilities. Investigate the board and review the extent to which current, this was put together in the year 2014, police department structure, budget, rules, and systems to promote that promote discrimination and bias on the basis of race, economic status, geographic location, and gender. We also indicated that this document is to establish a People's Council to the Civilian Review Board with the authority to receive, investigate, and litigate as provided in this proposal, that is a larger document, any complaint concerning the operation and actions of the Rochester Police Department, including their adoption of the stop and frisk law. We also indicated this um, review board shall have, shall have the power of subpoena witnesses. The power of subpoena has been the toughest hurdle uh, that we've had to go, that we went through. Uh, but nonetheless, this is what we had indicated. Possibly administer oaths, take testimony, and require the production of evidence, that is the board, to enforce a subpoena or other order for the production of evidence or to impose any penalty prescribed for failure to obey a subpoena or other legal order. The council shall have the right of application to the appropriate court. And we also indicated that the grand jury has appropriate findings, they should be made public. Public disclosure of grand jury actions is critical in developing trust in the grand jury system that does not exist, that leans heavily in the support and favor of police who violate civil and human rights. Legal procedure does exist for reports of grand jury to be made public, particularly when the public has reason to believe that true justice may not be carried out. I won't go into the rest of that particular aspect, but just to let you know that uh, this is from our original 32-page document. Uh, I need to share with you that the first police officer of color was not uh, brought on the police force until the year 1947. He still lives, he's in his 90s, his name is Charles Price, and he had an honorable tenure with the Rochester Police Department. We're still struggling over these issues. These issues are paramount. One of the things that um, we had discussed, um, it would have been made had the Metropolitan Police um, proposal not offered by us but offered by others been accepted it was of course rejected but nonetheless one would be it would have been academic uh, priorities in the terms of being certain that all members of the Rochester Police Department um, have at least a two-year degree and also that in the course of that two years by curriculum they should be uh, have they would have to take a course in black history to give them a firm understanding of the people with whom most of them will be engaged with. One of the things also that we thought was very, would be very helpful to this process uh, in terms of the police community um, elements that we are talking about would be the uh, factual effective communication to recruit uh, qualified police officers, uh, black men, Hispanic men, and women uh, to the Rochester uh, Police Department. Uh, the numbers when we asked for this were low in all three categories. Uh, we are happy that there is an, an, there has been an increase in the percentage of black male officers, black female officers, and um, white female officers, but um, it still is a new portion of the Rochester Police Department that has not gotten the numbers together uh, quite yet. Uh, but this is where we are, uh, this is where I am, 
and uh, we're hopeful that through the educative process and we're hopeful that through the uh, correct direction of the uh, police department with respect to honoring uh, both documents uh, that we will find ourselves in a situation where the police have become uh, more accountable, far more accountable than they were 20 and 30 years ago when black lives absolutely did not matter. Thank you, Dr. Walker. We have representatives here from the East Coast and the West Coast because this issue is a national issue. Our next speaker will represent the West Coast from California. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Many of you may or may not know, but I'm a former police officer. I retired in March of uh, 2013 from the Indianapolis Police Department. So by the look on some of your faces, you're probably asking, how did I end up in oversight? And why am I doing this work? Well, I will say that as a police officer, I was always in oversight. I always, I always believed the tenets of, of oversight. I believe the constitutional policing principles, and I practice those. I began my career with Indianapolis Police Department in October of 1989. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I entered a department that had recently uh, been through a uh, corruption scandal. And the, during the time that I was being, uh, going through the process to get on the department, uh, they had sustained an incident where a young African-American male teenager who uh, was handcuffed and in the back of a patrol vehicle in front of the juvenile detention center uh, suffered a fatal gunshot wound to his head. And uh, that was a big scandal at the time. And so uh, I entered that department under those circumstances, yet and still I wanted to be a police officer. Um, during my first two years, uh, going through the academy and going through the field training process, I saw a lot of troubling things, many things. And, I, and mind you, I was born and raised in Indianapolis, so I was well f familiar with the city. Um, as, a, as an academy recruit, I had an instructor who was very racist, who did everything in his power to get me to quit. But instead, I angered him more by graduating number three in my class, so. <laughs> Thank you. So, began as, as, a, as an officer on the streets, as, as all do, and uh, within six years, I was uh, promoted to a homicide investigator. And that, at the time, was unheard of because I was not only one of the youngest officers to ever get promoted to homicide in the quickest amount of time, but I was the youngest African-American officer to ever get uh, promoted. And again, I uh, had to deal with the racism, overt racism of, of that accomplishment, um, and also the jealousy, because as it turned out, I was pretty good at investigating homicides, and with my connections to the city, I was able to solve, uh, throughout my tenure as a homicide detective, um, almost 98% of my homicides with an arrest. I solved all of the homicides, but as you know, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. So I did solve them all, but I could only take about 98% of them to the prosecutor and get a, uh, successful uh, charges filed and get convictions. But also help solve other people's homicides. So um, that opportunity during my almost 10 years as a homicide investigator placed me in a lot of situations that as a patrol officer or, or a rank and file officer you did not uh, see. Many of those situations uh, had me privy to a lot of conversations, particularly conversations surrounding officer-involved shootings and how you make a bad shooting justified. And that was very troubling for me. And in fact, um, after a while, I was excluded from those conversations where I investigated officer-involved shootings. I knew that uh, maybe the officer didn't follow policy and, and procedures, maybe created a situation that would uh, 
require the use of force. But then conversations were made after those facts were, were brought out of how to make this a justified shooting. And that was troubling. But that was the culture that I was involved in. Um, you know, I lived in the community that I've worked in. My family shopped and went to church in the community. Uh, my kids went to school in the community. So I was very much a part of the community. And to see these things happening within the uh, upper levels of the police department and the city government, and then have to be out in the community, I had to make a decision. And I decided that I was gonna serve my community. And so um, I did that the best way I could while working within that environment and trying to take care of you know, my family and raise my family. Uh, one of the things that at the time Indianapolis Police did not have uh, was a, like a professional standards di division or a division where they would investigate officers that committed criminal acts. We had an internal affairs department uh, like most departments do, and we, it, uh, the internal affairs was, was responsible for administrative uh, allegations, but not criminal. So myself and a few other, uh, select few other uh, detectives were uh, tapped by the assistant chief of police to conduct those investigations from time to time. And so I found myself on, on several occasions, unfortunately, conducting criminal investigations against fellow coworkers and in each of those, we were able to uh, obtain charges, albeit in a political climate, it uh, didn't always go the way we wanted, but we were able to uh, secure the charges against officers that committed criminal acts. And uh, some of those officers were charged and convicted, others either pled guilty or uh, once we turned over our investigation, it disappeared, unfortunately. But that again was the reality that uh, we worked in. So I retired, like I said, in March of 2013. And during my 23 and a half years uh, experience as a police officer, I held a lot of different positions. Uh, became a field supervisor, uh, unit supervisor, uh, became a, a OK program co coordinator. And the OK program was a program that myself and my partner at the time, homicide partner at the time, we, we found it. And it's a law enforcement-based mentoring program that we ironically found operating in uh, Rancho Cordova, California, which is about 50 miles from where I currently live now. And we brought it to Indianapolis. And it's uh, based on uh, mentoring to African-American male teenagers. And it's law enforcement-based. And we were able to convince the department uh, to allow us to do that as police officers with the department uh, their contribution was paying our salary, providing our benefits, as they would if we were on the street patrolling. And uh, we got to do that full time. And then, of course, we had community buy-in. Uh, and we funded this program, which at its height, if we had to pay for everything that we provided to the community, would have been in excess of $1.2 million. But we were able to fund it with contributions and annually, through uh, nickels and dimes, I was able to raise $50,000 in cash, roughly, to actually pay for the things we had to pay for. But we convinced the community to provide us all the resources we needed. And usually at the end of the year, we were able to take anywhere from 20 to 25 of the uh, successful mentees on a week-long trip. And we took them to places like Atlanta, Georgia, Washington, DC, New York City, uh, Florida, and uh, when we took them, it was completely paid for, and they didn't have to pay a dime. And we also took about 10 uh, uh, chaperones. So you're talking about $35,000 or so trip that we were able to fund, and we were able to have direct contact with these young boys. So we were, I was very proud of that. And that program continues today. In fact, one of the rookie officers that uh, I supervised uh, when he first came on, is now the coordinator for the program. So I'm very proud of that con continuation. But all of those efforts are what helped drive me, a former law enforcement officer, to really get involved in this side of uh, the problem. 
you know, I've worked from it from the inside and, and I've worked from, from the outside. And as I retired, I immediately took a position in Chicago uh, with the Independent Police Review Authority where I led a team of investigators and we investigated Chicago police officers. That was a job. Chicago Police Department averages about one officer involved shooting a week, sometimes more. I remember one weekend we had five, and that's just on the shootings. You know, we're not talking about the other uh, uses of force and other incidents that occur in a 13,000 member, uh, sworn member department. But as a team, we investigated all of those incidents. We investigated the domestic violence, sexual assaults, uh, in custody death in incidents, and we investigated those. And when I inherited my team, uh, we had some cases that were three to five years old. We're talking shootings and uh, excessive force cases that had been sitting around for three to five years. And we quickly learned that the administration of IPRA, that's the acronym for the agency, uh, they had no expectation of trying to get those cases solved quickly. Um, I thought I was entering an agency that was independent of the police department that was to hold officers accountable, that was to uh, you know, make the department better, make the community safer, and help build trust, but that's not what we were doing. And being the person that I am, I began to push back, which created more fr friction. But what I did with my team, because I could only control certain things, I was able to take those cases that were oldest and move those through adjudication to uh, reach some findings. And so within about a year, we had gotten our caseload down to where our oldest cases were about 180 days, 200 days, which still is a long time, but compared to three or five years, it was a, a great improvement. But the other problem I found was that we had moved the cases from our end of the office and we had recommended findings, but now they were sitting on my administrator's desk. And, uh, for whatever reasons, they would not be pushed through to the police department or they did not like the findings. And we, I would get pushed back. So probably about 18 months into that job, I realized I could not fight the Chicago system. It is a huge machine and you know, I could, there's no way I as a single person could fight that system. But I was able to secure a position in Oakland uh, when an opening came up to be their executive director for the Citizens Police Review Board. So I packed up my family and moved to Oakland. And uh, when I got there, first day on the job, the city administrator told me, make the CPRB relevant. Whatever resources you need, make it relevant. He then further told me that there was a push in the community to create a police commission. But in order for that commission to be successful, the CPRB, which would be the investigative arm of it, had to be successful. So from 2014 to uh, roughly 2016, spent a lot of money that the city provided to hire and increase our staff from two investigators to five full-time investigators, to bring on a policy analyst full-time, to bring three intake technicians in to help process and receive the complaints, to take a temporary employee and turn her into a full-time office assistant and also hire a part-time office assistant. And we got funding through fiscal year 19 to hire two more investigators and now a supervising investigator. Our caseload in 2014, at the end of 2014, was 47 cases. And I found that shocking when I looked at the annual report for the police department, for Oakland Police Department and their internal affairs had received over 700. And the ordinance that we had that governed our operations stated that internal affairs and the CPRB were supposed to send complaints over within 24 hours. So if we received one, we were to send it to IAD and they were to send citizen complaints over to us. Guess who had been sending complaints? and who hadn't. <laughs> so through uh, a quick conversation with a certain captain, 
of Internal Affairs, who I, whom I had to remind I was a department head, so even though I was not a police officer, I outranked them, and should I go to their department head for violating the ordinance, there would be problems. See, I could do that because I was a former police officer. I knew how to talk that language. We were able to increase the number of cases. So in 2015, we had, I think, 500, I got a note here. Oh, no, we had 453 cases. Now, when I had to report to the city council that year, they wanted to know why the increase in complaints had gone up and what was the, you know, what was, was the catalyst. And I told them, I said, the increase hasn't gone up. We're just now getting them be, like we should have before. You know, the, the people have always complained, but they weren't being sent to us to, to process. So we went from 453 to 2016, 531, and at the end of 2017, we had 506 cases. So we've been able to help uh, process those cases, reach uh, a finding, and almost all of those cases, I think, uh, just off the top of my head at the last numbers, we had 10% of those cases that we were not able to reach a finding. And, that, and when I say that, the finding was not sustained, which doesn't leave anyone any answers. So out of all of the cases, we had over 90% of them that we were able to adjudicate one way or the other. And about 23% of those were sustained findings against police officers. So we were able to, to accomplish that. Now, the same time we were doing all of this internally with CPRB, the community was working. And I worked closely with the community, met with them on several occasions, and the community and the activists were out there doing their job, which was to push for the police commission. So in November of 2016, like, like Ted said, there was a ballot measure uh, that made it to the ballot in part because of the sex scandal that broke in early 2016. And that was the, the last straw that forced all of the city councilors to unanimous, unanimously agree to put this on the ballot because failure to do that would have been death to them. And it passed with over 80% of the vote. So thank you. So here in Oakland, now you had the investigative in infrastructure that was finally in place. You had the uh, community infrastructure for the police commission that was now uh, going to go forward. And uh, we still have a lot of work to do. So one of the other things that I had to do was develop a uh, way to capture all of the data, be able to use the data in a meaningful way, and a way to better process the complaints that we were receiving. Because we anticipated an increase in complaints with the police commission, because now it was a revived interest and renewed faith in the system from some of the community members that now that we had uh, a system with more teeth and more authority, things would be done. So uh, I worked with our IT department and we created a mobile app and a database and case management system for my, for my agency. The mobile app is just what it is. It's an app that people can use on their cell phone or any other mobile tablet or device to file a complaint. So if you're on scene of a location, even if you're not involved, and you see something that's occurring, you can shoot a video, log into the app, and send it to us. From, from thank you. And on our side, even if I got 50 videos of the same incident, I can link all of those 50 to the single incident and that gives me 50 different perspectives, not just the body-worn camera. And it helps us make a better, more informed decision. Um, we have a complaint portal where people can log in and monitor the uh, progress of their complaint. They can uh, add uh, documents or any other evidence directly to the file, which, goes, which is electronically sent to one of my investigators. And like I said, it can be used uh, 
with any device that has internet capability. Now on our side, on the internal portal, as a manager, I can now uh, have instant access to see how long it's been since one of my investigators has actually touched one of their files. Because if they don't go in there and put something in there after a certain amount of time, it's going to send them and myself an email that says, hey, do something with this file. And so that helps, again, move the cases along a, a lot quicker. It also helps uh, with the sh file sharing between us and internal affairs to where if we get a new witness, you know, since we're working the cases simultaneously, we're not in competition with them. We all want to find and adjudicate the cases properly. So if we come up with a new witness, it'll send an email to their investigator who will know, okay, there's something new on, on the case as opposed to having to pick up the phone, try to track them down, and vice versa. And, uh, and then we're working now with IAD to get a similar system on their side to send to us. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. So I ran out of time, and I, and I, I got notes, and I ran over that. But the commission is now is functioning. We met December of 2017, and now they're still going through their training uh, to learn how to do this work so that they can do it effectively. So it's still in its infancy, but we have great expectation that uh, it will be very successful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fennell. And now we're going to have insights from the East Coast with Mr. Monterosa. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So again, my name is Victor Monterosa, and I'm uh, here from Newark, New Jersey. Welcome, or oh, well, not welcome, greetings from Newark, New Jersey, sorry. Uh, I um, am, I grew up in Newark, and I, when I was 15, I uh, became involved in activism there. Uh, I went to school and returned and continued my activism and I got into several different aspects of organizing there. Um, I eventually, one of the, the largest ones is uh, um, this issue of police misconduct and uh, I went to law school and shortly after I graduated, um, my wife was working at Ironbound Community Corporation, a, a large nonprofit in, in Newark, a very old, long time nonprofit in Newark. Uh, they were looking for a nominee for uh, a, a civilian complaint review board that was supposed to be put together. And at the moment, I, I, I didn't know all that much about it. And uh, I, I feel like I could tell a story in my, my sleep now. Uh, be, this, what, what went on in Newark is very similar to what happened here and happened in so many other places around the country. Um, in 1967, on a hot summer day almost 51 years ago, uh, there was a, a man, John Smith, who was uh, dragged and beaten by the police uh, about an inch away from losing his life. And folks in Newark, unfortunately, had seen this so often and had already been uh, uh, really, they were done being terrorized by the police. Uh, and this was at the same time that uh, the, at the medical school that was being built there was threatening taking uh, several uh, several dozens of acres of downtown and displacing people, uh, getting rid of, of tons of housing, um, no jobs. Uh, th there just seemed like there was no possibility and then at the same time you're, you're getting killed right at home. Uh, there, uh, the word got around re really quickly and a large group formed right outside of the uh, uh, precinct. The, the rumor was that John Smith was killed. So a lot of people were very angry and they wanted something to be done immediately. Um, the rebellion broke out and um, for several days Newark was on fire. Uh, the, shortly after, um, or not naturally after, but during, many of you might have seen the footage, I know they were talking about the, the, the uh, Rebellion 67 uh, film, but the, the National Guard did come in, uh, people did lose their lives, several people uh, were hurt, uh, children were shot at, and um, not too long after uh, that incident, the, uh, I believe it was the governor of New Jersey put out a, a, a report and one of the findings, uh, so this was by 1968, one of the findings were that 
Newark needed a civilian complaint review board. And that's one of the first times you saw uh, the use. The, the earliest time that I've been able to see before that was 1962, but the first official government uh, a, a re request or, or suggestion that there needed to be a uh, civilian re review was in, in 1968 in that report. Uh, it took from 1968 until 2016 to actually have an ordinance passed in Newark. Uh, there were several attempts and some of them had fallen apart. Um, there, there was definitely a grassroots movement. Uh, there, there, uh, a group of, of citizens, different groups of citizens who wanted civilian uh, review and were always involved to one extent or another. Uh, but by the, the, what, what happened in, in, by 2014 is that um, there was a big change in administration. Uh, the uh, Mayor Booker had uh, gone into the Senate and we had an interim mayor, Quintana, and um, uh, many of you might know, um, Mayor Baraka, son of, of Amiri Baraka, ran and um, he, he became mayor. And one of he, there were several things that he wanted to get done in the city that simply hadn't been done in the past, and this was one of them. So um, he wanted to make sure that a civilian complaint review board would get done. So he wrote up an ordinance and he, he attempted to, to push it forward, uh, but he received a, a, a friendly uh, um, note from the ACLU, who took a look at, at the ordinance that was prepared and said, I think that th there's another way that we can approach this, just, just be careful because you're definitely gonna get attacked. They're, they're definitely gonna try to pull apart this ordinance. Around the same time, a report came out from the Department of Justice. And that report indicates that nine out of every 10 stops in Newark were unconstitutional. Um, so uh, there, almost everybody that got, got stopped in Newark, well, their constitutional rights were being violated. Um, this along with the fact that uh, the, in the, of the internal affairs uh, reports, um, very few of them were ever actually being filed and almost none of them were sustained. I think three of them were seriously, uh, over a period of a decade in, in that DOJ report, um, you see that three of them uh, were, were got to some type of ending process and only one of them was sustained, uh, which was later withdrawn. So the, the IA system just wasn't working at all. The policing uh, definitely wasn't working or, or wasn't uh, serving the community. Uh, and ACLU said, um, you know, Mayor, let's sit down and, and let's start figuring out how we can put together uh, a, a, a good, a strong civilian complaint review board. Uh, so the ACLU, uh, they hired an organizer to start something called the Newark Communities for Accountable Policing. NCAP for short. And this organization united, uh, or is, is still organizing, several grassroots organizations in Newark that are interested in doing something about uh, uh, police misconduct. One of those being Ironbound Community Corporation, the organization that nominated me. And, and of those several organizations, um, the first idea was, well, if we want to make sure that there's gonna be civilian review, we wanna make sure that there are gonna be civilians who, who are accountable to people in the community on that board, and six of the members of that group, NCAP, were written into the ordinance. So um, there are, are six nonprofits that immediately get uh, uh, to nominate people right from the community on that board. Um, and in addition to that, I, I, that's one of the things that I just, I really like because I see that there's that direct relationship. But some of the more powerful features, of course, are first, the subpoena power. Uh, the, the city of Newark granted subpoena power to the board so that they can summon uh, folks to, to, to answer. Otherwise, uh, people will not show up and, th and there won't be any type of uh, decision afterwards. Um, along with that was what we call the dual powers. And the CCRB in Newark not only would be able to, uh, when it was written, write uh, uh, or do, uh, adjudicate by doing an investigation on their own as, a, as the CCRB, uh, however, they would also be able to review internal investigation, uh, um, internal affair rever uh, investigations. And um, that, that was really exciting. Uh, the, there's also this uh, quarterly reporting and, and a much larger uh, yearly reporting that's supposed to go on. Uh, go on. And it, everything, I mean, look, it looked great. It, it was well put together. Uh, it initially got passed by executive order. It was then passed by the uh, council unanimously. Uh, but something 
interesting happened after that, which was uh, it, it, there was this, this kind of feeling of when is the, when is the, the police lawsuit going to come in? Everyone knew that the police uh, had threatened to sue. They had succeeded in the past uh, with, with one attempt to bring up or to form a civilian complaint review board. And so everyone was kind of waiting for it. Uh, and during that time, so uh, there's the, the unanimous, or there was the, the passage by executive order, and um, I was one of the first people that were able to sit down at the table, and I got to see everyone gradually join. Uh, but during this time, um, and, and I bring this up only because we, we must all be vigilant of this. Be because we were waiting for the lawsuit, we didn't train people on time. We didn't create the infrastructure that was uh, necessary. And I, I could explain a, a bit more of what exactly that looks like. Um, but we did take visits, for example, to the organization in New York City. And we saw um, e even the numbers that, that, that you're mentioning or, or that I'm hearing in, in, this, in this proposal uh, is a lot more than Newark was willing to do or has been willi willing to do in the last couple of years. Um, the, Ordinance itself says that we should start off with a budget of $500,000, and that has never been appropriated. We've only received $50,000. Um, and so we, we're, we've been somewhat stuck. We did get the, this, this uh, uh, ordinance passed. Um, and then the other shoe dropped, which was they finally sued. The FOP and, and, and PBA finally sued, and then everything really did come to a standstill. We didn't know uh, what exactly was going to go on. There was some issue uh, with corporate counsel, and um, eventually, what, what we it, eventually they, they, that lawsuit, that first lawsuit was an, an employment lawsuit. It was actually an administrative action, um, and it was uh, saying that the police contracts that this would violate police contracts because it was uh, extra disciplinary. And um, the, the judge uh, did not find that this was extra dis uh, disciplinary, but in a later um, suit, a, uh, one of the judges in the civil court decided to place the injunction, and we lost um, subpoena power. Um, we now are able to review, and to, uh, review policy and train. Uh, we can look over uh, uh, some of the IA investigations only to a certain extent. Uh, but what we've been told as the Civilian Complaint Review Board by, by the mayor is um, that we need to push the envelope because right now we're in a, in a gray space where we have a, a judicial order that, that says some things that we can't do and it's unclear to what extent we, we can, can or can't do it. Uh, as the CCRB ourselves, we continue be, being committed to creating the infrastructure that's necessary. Uh, besides just the board members and the investigators, there will need to be a, a lot of training. There will need to be um, a lot of computers and computer se uh, security. Uh, there, there will, I mean, it, the, if you, when, and I know it's, it's super far away from here, but if you ever get the chance to, to, to visit um, the, the CCRB in New York City, I mean, I, I think that's something that we can all aspi aspire to, to at least have an infrastructure like that, a, a, an office setting um, like that. So um, I, I am very glad, and in Newark, we are very proud that we have still uh, passed one of the strongest uh, civilian complaint re uh, review board ordinances. Uh, we are waiting, however, to see um, where where uh, the cars are going to lie. Our, how strong can we um, be? Will we be able to fight back um, the injunction in, in, an, in an upcoming appeal? Um, these are all questions that you know it's going to take time before we, we receive an answer, uh, but perhaps the most important part of all of this is that the, the, the people of Newark didn't just stay on, oh, our civilian complaint review board didn't work and now we don't have um, oversight. Instead, um, the mayor uh, started one program called the, the Civilian Cr Clergy um, uh, Officer Committee and what that allows is for civilians and clergy to work with police and actually uh, be on the streets with them. And this has uh, led to de-escalation of some issues. It's, it, it is more on, on board with the idea of uh, community policing and it, in that way without the uh, direct review, there's still influence from the community and community leaders on the police. Um, likewise, there are, there are, there's an increase in precinct meetings which existed um, before, but there, this, there's a, it almost would happen voluntarily. Uh, now there's more of a, of a need to have them regularly and, and this push to make sure that um, folks are accountable or that police are accountable to folks in the community. Um, NCAP is continuing to, to get more um, of their 
leaders on board. Uh, but even in, in that sense, we have to uh, be vigilant because some folks wanted to take community people off of the board. Um, so my, my, my point is the, the reason that we've gotten this far, the reason why between uh, 68 to 16 something finally got passed is because of, of, of the power that people are able to put together, the, the concerned citizens. Don't give up no matter what because um, what, whatever we're pushing towards is really um, that goal. And policing is, is not only a board, this is a very integral part of it, but there's a lot that we can do to make sure that we reduce police misconduct. Thank you, Mr. Monterosa. And now we will have Pastor Wanda Wilson, who will describe for us what is happening now in Rochester. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, what's going on in Rochester? Well, let me start by telling you that right now we have a 2% sustain rate when it comes to citizen alleged complaints regarding police misconduct or police brutality, 2%. So that means that 98% when a citizen makes a complaint, what happens to it, right? 98%, unfounded, unprovable, exonerated. Two, we only have a 2% rate. That is not what we are going to stand for in the city of Rochester. It has to be better. I always throw my scripture in here because I, we say that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in this earth realm and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we're wrestling against. Right now, the Civilian Review Board, the way that it is set up, it is a broken system. Right now, we have a civilian review board that is basically organized or governed by the CDS, the Civilian uh, C uh, um, Center for Dispute Settlement. Thank you. That is the organization that currently receives the contract from the Rochester Police Department. That is the place where, who, who is, who, where the structure is set up and it comes out of for how the Civilian Review Board is structured. They handle that. Now, how can the police police the police? They, what I'm saying to you is the CDS receives the contract from the Rochester Police Department. They are the ones who are appointing panel members and the chair. So ultimately, they are the ones who are staffing or stacking the, C the Citizens Review Board right now. What kind of feedback can we really honestly expect to be given back to, or the, what kind of decisions are we really expecting the CRB to really make if you are sitting in the seat of the person that receives the contract? If you are being paid by RPD, if you are being trained by RPD, are, you are, are we as citizens really supposed to believe that the board that is in place today can be a board that is not influenced by the Rochester Police Department? Can we really, really expect for this board to be objective in its decision making when it's about police misconduct or allegations of citizens' abuse, right? How can we expect for the current board that is in place to be a board that is going to um, be one that is about the citizens of Rochester, New York? Right there you have a huge, a huge conflict of interest and you have a broken system. Number two, we have a 2% sustained rate by the chief of police, 5% sustained rate by the CRB. Now, if the, if the crust or the core of where the decision making is made when it comes about, when it, the decision is made for um, police misconduct is in the hands basically of the chief of police, 
and the board is supposed to be there to give recommendations and work together. That's not happening. There's a conflict here, people. I'm not going to be try to be deep with you, but we cannot continue to allow the current system to operate the way that it's operating now. So what we are asking for, you know, when we when when um, Victor was talking, and I heard, you know, like the I think the air kind of almost got sucked out of the room when he talked about how long they've been on the battlefield. But let me give you a little bit of history about Rochester and CRBs. 1963 was the first public outcry for some kind of a police advisory board. It was established, but the police union fought it tremendously and resisted it. And in 1970, they were as successful in seeing the police advisory board disbanded totally. Then, and Dr. Walker can probably speak to some of this as well, then back in 1977, City Council adopted recommendations from a Citizens Committee on Police Affairs. Then in 1980, under the leadership of Dr. and Reverend Graves and, Dr. and Franklin Florence, there was another strong community outcry for better community police relations. It was not until 1992 that there was a board put into place. Why? Because the chief of police was found guilty of embezzlement and conspiracy. We have been, come on here, give, we have been on the battlefield since 19, if you want to be real, since 1963 with no change. We are not any better than we were before, than we are today. So that's why we're here to say we want a, uh, we want a police accountability board that has five powers, five powers. We want a police accountability board that has teeth, five powers. What are those five powers? Let me find my notes. Five power, independent, independent of the current police department. No funding from the police department. Totally, the budget is totally independent. Yes, we want subpoena power. Yes, city council, you can have your subpoena power. It's amazing how people, how some, some of the, some people from city council are now talking about they're not going to give up their subpoena power. Well, you had it all this time and you did not use it until last year in the case of Ricky Bryant. Keep your, keep your subpoena power, but this board also wants subpoena power as well to be able to, come on, to be able to do its own independent investigations. We don't want to take anything away from you, City Council. We want to work with you. We want to be able to conduct our own hearings. Yes, we want to be able to give recommendations for discipline. We have, yes. Yes, and we're not trying to wipe anybody out. We're not trying to take anybody off the mat. Somebody's got to be accountable here. Look, let's keep it real. Did anybody see the video on Facebook about the two officers on Conkey Avenue? Fighting each other. If that's what's going on internally what do you, with each other, what do you think they're going to do to citizens on the street? You got an internal problem. We want to be able as the board to be able to evaluate the systemic patterns and practices that are taking place inside of that department. Because guess what? It's you told on yourself on that video because it's spilling over into the community. How can you expect the community to respect you when you're not modeling the behavior you want from the citizens? Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Our people should be able to be free in their communities. Rolling up behind us like they on a hunt. What kind of mess is this? 
You'll be traumatized for a month if you missing a tail light. And I got a witness. You'll be scared they're going to roll up on you and a stock from a, a broken tail light can run into you being bankrupt. Huh? Because you're going to stay in the court for this, for that. Could end up with you losing your life. We're not here. We're not here to back down from them five points. We can't. We can't. Because we got a list of names in this report done by Barbara Lackaware and Ted Forsythe of people that have lost their lives. See, we can't keep playing like this. We have given the Rochester Police Department and their oversight, whoever watches over them, the mayor is at it, city council, nothing against people personally. Please understand this. We have given you the opportunity to do your job, but you're not doing it correctly. Because especially in poor communities and people of color, that is where we see the disparity to the most. Those are the people who are impacted and affected negatively the most. And this cannot continue. I'm appealing straight to city council. And those of you who are sitting on city council, this cannot continue to happen. And those of you who are people of color, we need you to step up and represent today. I don't know, it's my time up because I'll start preaching. You know, I'm a preacher. Uh. <laughs> I'm done? No, you are not done. As a matter of fact, I think you just did the summary and everything else and our call to action. But I would like to briefly summarize Pastor Wanda because you are going to do our call to action because this, it's, it's just been going on way too long. We have um, Dr. Walker who has presented from the perspective of the past. So we have heard what has gone on. We have heard from what, has, what can happen positively in California. I mean, really, an, a mobile app where you can report? Come on now. <laughs> we have heard from New Newark what can happen when the infrastructure is not strong, when the money is not there, when the community is not in back of you. We have heard what can happen when you don't have subpoena power. We need to stick with that. And we have heard the need for a call to action, not, on, not only on the moral and ethical level, but on the spiritual level. Because as Pastor Wanda says, come on people, right is right and wrong is wrong. Call to action. All right, so we cannot stay in this fight alone. All of us that are activists here locally around the world, we always need the community. We need the partnership of the community to help us, okay? So we got some strong people, yes, that are on the battlefield, but we need the backing of the community. We need the backing of all of the spiritual leaders in Rochester. What are we asking you to do? How are we asking you to back us? Number one, speak to council. Go sign up, speak to council, tell them that you support this police accountability board. We need you, to, when the events are coming up, show up with us. Thank you for being here today, but show up with us, amen? <laughs> Spread it all over media. Spread it all over your Facebook page. Get on Twitter, just go ballistic. This is one time you can just let it all hang out. Spread it like never before. We need that kind of support. We need your support as well in uh, funds, and, and I know, I think I saw the basket go around earlier today. If you didn't give, have a chance to give, we are asking for people to give at least at a minimum of 10, but of course we will, $10, but of course we'll take more than that. Why are we asking for funds for support? Well, we gotta print brochures, we have to rent places when we do our forums, and we are looking for support monetarily for legal counsel, amen? We've had some 
excellent legal counsel that has helped us along the way, but we understand the journey. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Anthony. We understand the journey, and we in this for the long haul, so we need that kind of support as well. And then if you ever want to contact us, we have a Facebook page, Enough is Enough, correct, and email addresses. So that's what we're asking you to do. Amen. Thank you. So that is our call to action. The basket is being passed around now. Pass the basket. They did already? That's great. Okay, that's good. We have a member from City Council here, Willie Lightfoot, who would like to say a few words. From City Council. <laughs> Mr. Lightfoot. Thank you, um, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you're getting me all excited. <laughs> um, first of all, I'm moving. I'm moving. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the panel here, Anthony Fenno. I definitely want to get my contact information for you. You have some great things that I hope that we continue to share information to help us as we move forward in this journey. Uh, the Pastor Wanda, Victor Montrasso, uh, Dr. Walker, of course, a good long-term friend of mine, uh, and all greetings to all of you and to everyone who's put this together, Ted and all. Um, I'm here, my daughter graduated this weekend, I'm supposed to be at a graduation celebration. But this is how important this is to me, you know, that I'm here. I'm, I don't stand here for nobody else other than myself, and speaking for myself. But I'm also, I have a responsibility, um, because you guys elected me, uh, some of you. <laughs> and, um, and also I was appointed as chair of public safety youth and recreation. So this falls on my desk. So that's why I'm here. Uh, and I would say this, there's some things just very briefly, and uh, I would say that I agree with a lot that's been said. There's some things that I think that um, there's some misconstrued things that as, as, as I'm doing my research that I'm seeing um, in this whole case. Because there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of information. This is, this is a big problem, it's been a long going problem, and oftentimes I often uh, say to people, uh, uh, it's a little ping in there, um, oftentimes I say to people, um, what have people been doing in the past? You know, because people are putting a lot of expectations for this to be done, and I commend that. I commend the work that you're doing. Uh, President Loretta Scott uh, has pr made some promises concerning the police, the independent police accountability review. We're taking our time not because we're not trying to get it done. There is a lot on the table. However, we want to get it right. You understand what I'm saying to you? I don't want, we don't just want to put something together just to please uh, the individuals and, and then they go run off and go away and then it, maybe it doesn't work like um, my brother was telling me about New Jersey not having the proper infrastructure in place. We want to make sure that we have all of the information, all of the infrastructure, because this is a two-part issue. One is getting something that makes sense, and I believe we're going to have somewhat of a hybrid form, which may be a hybrid of Oakland, a hybrid of New York City, a hybrid of New, of New Jersey, and, and that Rochester could actually be uh, on a national level that we become the model and not others. That, so that, that's what we're trying to accomplish. Number two, we can only take this particular situation so far. Because like Oakland, I believe, as I did my research on Oakland, uh, the state law uh, 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 prohibits them from sharing certain information about sustainability. And then I know that's what most people want. They want to know how, what has happened to these officers. And New York state law also prohibits some of that information from being shared. So don't just leave this at city council steps. This goes all the way to Albany. Now if you want enough is enough, then you need to be telling your Albany state assembly members, senators, and the people in Albany that some laws need to be changed to give us the teeth that you are requiring from us to give you. Because we can only give you so much. Am I right or wrong from the brother from Oakland? Uh, there are some state, Oakland has some, California has some very serious state laws that prohibit some of the things that you want from us to be able to do. So I just want to keep that in mind as we're with you, said you want to partner with us. So just keep that in mind that one, we're going to get it right together, right? But when we get it right, the fight doesn't stop at City Hall. The fight, then we take the fight to Albany. Hello, somebody. I look like I'm talking to myself up in here. The fight then 
student has to go to Albany. Y'all want to keep it real? That's the real story. That it begins here, but it has to go further than here in order to get the real accountability that we're asking for. So I want to say this in my closing. We are with you. I'm here. We're with you. I'm listening. We're taking notes. We're going to connect with all of the people that we need to connect to so we can get this right. And I want to tell you there is nothing more uh, pressing in this time. And the difference, Dr. Dr. Walker, between 50 years ago and now, you said there was a, 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 a mayor that didn't look at it. Well, now you have a mayor that cares. You said there was a city council with one African American and one Latino. Now we have a historic city council. For the first time ever in the history of Rochester, you have five African Americans on city council who care and who are looking at this, and we are going to get it done. Thank you, Councilman. So Councilman Lightfoot has said that city council is going to do all that they can do, and we as a community, and enough is enough, we will take city council and Albany on. I'm sorry, what did, I missed that part. Oh, take it to the top. <laughs> all right. We're now at, at quarter of three, and so we would like to have an opportunity for audience questions because we have a very strong and informed uh, panel here. So if you do have a question, please feel free to come up. And while you're doing that, that's right. If you are shy, we have someone who is passing out three by five cards and pencils. So you can ask your, um, ask your question. So you can, you can come up, and while we're doing that, I do have a question for a panelist, little, and that question is, what do you wish that you, what do you know now that you wish you had known at the beginning? What do you know now that you wish you had known at the beginning? Thank you. Uh, I, I wish I really understood uh, then, in comparison to now, that uh, a, a lot of this you are making your own uh, way. Not, not your individual own way, but if, if the community is getting together and saying, um, this is what we want, um, it, 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 it's, it's you that's making that demand. And it, it's, you're the, the fuel behind it. You're going to have a lot of folks who will tell you, this can't be done because of X law or um, one uh, government representative or elected official or the other will tell you, no, I don't think this could happen because of X, Y, and Z reason. Uh, the, the reality is that you, you have to, uh, as I said earlier, push the envelope. You, you have to make sure that you, you figure out what the boundaries are because otherwise um, time right, might run out and you may be too late. So um, don't let time run out, take the chances um, you know, some folks, and one of them that believe sometimes it's better to uh, uh, apologize than um, ask for forgiveness. Uh, it, it, sometimes you, I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> do it then ask for there we go. Because that's my motto. Right, right. <laughs> to do it first and then ask for forgiveness. Uh, because um, sometimes folks will, will correct you or, or you'll find out later on what it is you couldn't have actually done. But you, you really won't know until you're confronted with that. Thank you. And real briefly, I, I guess I wish I had gotten involved to this level while I was still on the police department. Because once I got on this side and actually saw some of the laws that were actually passed, not that I could have stopped them, but I sure would have ran block and tried to, you know, <laughs> because it, these things just don't make sense and they do make it uh, very difficult to. Uh, provide information that I think we should uh, be providing to the community. And uh, the reasoning, to me, doesn't make sense, even though it sounds good on paper. So that would be my wish. So it sounds to me like if we're going to change the status quo, it has to be pushed and challenged. Okay. All right, we have a number of people here who would like to ask a question of the panelists. 
Hello, my name is Marcus Williams. Um, last year I was running for city council. Next year I'm going to be running again, but this time instead of for an open seat for Southwest City Council. Okay, I am very concerned, not just by what goes on in our community with the police, what we allow to go on in our community with the police. Okay, because what's going on right now is the police believe that they can do whatever they want and not be held accountable. That's exactly. why we're here today, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and the accountability board is a good step. But where are our people from our neighborhoods that are getting on the police force? How come there isn't more of that? I hear all of these people, I talk to tons of police officers, I love the police, don't get it twisted, okay? They protect my house from people breaking in, <laughs> okay? But a large thing is, is that they're not from here. They're not from where we live. And they feel like they can do whatever they want because they're not from here. And it's a disconnect between them knowing who they are and us being residents and citizens. It's a lot about the power and control that they feel that they have, but at the end of the day, they're just people like us. Yeah. They're just people, yeah. okay? They're no better than you and me, but that's a large thing that people are forgetting. They got a little bit of power. And right now, we're feeling very powerless. And that's why we're making this move right now. But we need to do more. If the police are supposed to serve and protect, where is the community service? How come whenever they're doing events, everything is always overtime? I'm not saying they should do stuff for free, but an hour a week maybe of community service, outreach, so they know about the neighborhoods that they're policing so people can sense them and get a better sense of camaraderie with them because they're supposed to be here to protect us. We should feel comfortable with them in our neighborhoods, but right now we're not. And city council, like we just had Mr. Lightfoot up here, okay, he was telling us that he's looking to do something. I challenge everybody in here to hold them accountable, okay? Last year, only one of the people that I elected, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I wanna thank you for your comments. I know that your, your interest and your heart, your interest and your heart are here, it is. Thank you, thank you for your comments. So I guess this question is sort of tailored to, our, uh, to the gentleman from who, are, who came to join us today from afar, but um, I'd be interested in everyone's answer. But, so how would you want to change the current system you have in your city? Is it related to the budget, to the cooperation from your local police department, or is there some other issue that you really feel like would be beneficial to change about uh, the current accountability system in your city? I'll try not to get in trouble. <laughs> We, we, okay, we, we just started the commission, so that is a, a major change. Um, I, would, I would have, instead of starting in December, I would have liked to have taken more time before that the commission began to do its public work to get the training, to bring them in and actually uh, you know, teach them and, and work with them so that when they begin to meet as commission, they can actually do the work. Right now, we're in that training process. And yes, it sounds good to say we have it, but right now, we're still, they still need to learn what they're doing and every, they still need to have the organizational pieces in place. Uh, even with my agency, you know, we went from the CPRB to now a totally investigative agency, there's changes there. So that it takes time to do that. So before we just made a quick switch and from one to the other, I would have liked to have had, and I did recommend to the council and to others, to enact it and then give us 18 to 24 months to actually do it right. Give us the finances, give us the budget. We went, and see this is how, you know, how government works. We went from uh, July, of yeah, July 1 of 2017 through until the end of June of, of 2018, and the commission really doesn't have a budget. There was no money aside. I was able to foresee that and put extra money into my budget that I can transfer over, but that's still not enough. You know, so it's things like that where people will say, yeah, we're gonna do this, and yeah, we've got this, and look what we've done, but then when you actually have to do the work, uh, the resources aren't there. So the time to properly do it right and roll it out right is what I would like to have changed. Thank you. 
I, I think that, that that's really, uh, I, I wish we had something like that, like that amount of time. I think secondly, uh, something that, that's really necessary is, is an executive director, um, like this gentleman who's talking about so much that he's done because uh, we don't have an, uh, an ED over our board. We have the, the members uh, and we had to fight to get what, what um, the person's title is executive secretary, and she's been doing an excellent job. She's, she's amazing, and we've gotten much farther with her there, but uh, definitely one thing that I would have changed from the beginning is start off with an ED, start off with, with actually having the, the $500,000 uh, allocation that's in the ordinance to be enforced. Um, and although this isn't part of the system, but it shows you also where uh, the, 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 what the priority is of, 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 of the administration and the CCRB is that we are located in an old firehouse that is not ADA compliant. And half of our members have trouble getting up to the fourth floor. Uh, the, these are the types of things in the system that I would change. I mean, if, if it was this serious, and if it, were, it was this serious, and we put all this uh, push into it, there really need to, needs to be much more respect on, on that end. Thank you for those comments. I'm trying to bring a microphone closer to our, our um, audience for the question. So my question, uh, do you, uh, is you gonna be willing to come back? Because I'm gonna need you to come back here because there's a whole lot of people that need to be here that ain't here. Police chief, mayor, police union head, yeah. all of them need to be up in here. Yeah. Um, we've, this has been a long, long battle. Um, with no results. All this, take it to Albany, we've been taking it to Albany, ain't nothing been done. We about ready to take it to the streets. And I, I'm thinking that's probably what's gonna be the end result. Um, but we're gonna need you to come back because we need to get some more people up in here to listen to you. I was feeling you, my brother, man, you, you represent both, both sides of the coin. Um, but to be honest, the elephant in the room is that the people the status quo people that need to be in here ain't here. So I'm asking you, will you come back when we get them to come in this room? Yes. But, but I, wanna, I wanna add one thing that, you know, this is reality and we're gonna have to work with what we have. You may not ever get certain people in the room and even if you do, they may make a promise that they don't keep. So I've learned not to depend on those folks. Okay, I mean, they're there, and if they do it, great, but they, you know, I understand the mayor knew this was happening today, and she's somewhere else, you know. I, that tell, I don't know if she sent a representative. Is there a representative from the mayor here? No. So that, tell, that ought to tell you something, and I don't even know her, you know. She's probably a great lady, I don't know, but I'm just saying this is, has to be a priority and whether they ever come to the table or not doesn't mean you stop eating. You just do what you gotta do. Thank you, Mr. Fennell. Our next question. Before I ask my question, I do agree with the gentleman that was just up here. We do need to bring it to the streets. And if y'all ever catch me in the streets, I am that individual that brings it to the streets. My name is Jasenia Edgiston, and you will catch me in all the streets of Rochester. Thank you very much. And now my question is specifically is to this misconception of the law that um, city council member had just brought up here in regards to what can we actually find out and what is actually hidden to the eyes of the public. And I would appreciate if my co, um, Enough is Enough member, AJ, will actually assist me in answering that question. Please and thank you. Uh, okay, so my understanding is um, that, that under Civil uh, Rights Law 50A in the state of New York, that prevents disclosure of uh, disciplinary records from police officers to the public. So New York is one of three states around the country that has such a law that prevents disclosure of officers' disciplinary records to the public. That said, there's an exception to 50A, it's uh, 50A4, and that would allow any agency of city government, such as a police accountability board, to have access to all officer disciplinary records. So that means there's nothing in state law that would prevent a police accountability board from being able to do its job in the city of Rochester. <laughs> and, 
And secondly, so under the proposal that, that we've, heard, we've heard here today, uh, the, we're calling for a disciplinary matrix that would be a transparent, predictable model for what sorts of discipline should be imposed on officers who are convicted of certain sorts of misconduct. So there would be no more mystery about what happens to police officers. Now, we're not going to actually get the, the actual records released to the public without a court order, but we can at least know that there's a predictable model for what happens when an officer commits a certain amount of misconduct, and that model will be transparent to the public. So there is a way for the public to know what's going on in this city. And that model is fair. Our next person. Uh, hello, my name is Jeremy Coleman. I, um, I have mainly a question for you, Mr. Fennell. Um, I've been moved by your, your story and the, um, the, the perspective that you have from being on both, both sides of the, of the law and um, sort of a, a two-part. I, I was hoping that because you have a perspective from being both on the force and from investigating misconduct and being good at it. If you could, you could one, share um, sort of your experience around, I, I have a perceived culture of misconduct that often occurs within the, the police force, but I, I often see that from the outside. Um, and so maybe if you could speak to that a little bit in, in your experience of, of what that's, that's been like for you and your work, as well as setting up the Civilian Review Board in Oakland, how that has affected the relationship between you and you and officers, or I should say that the Civilian Review Board and professional standards. I'm, I'm somewhat curious to know how those two organizations get along. Is it um, competitive? Do, are, is it cooperative? And if you could tie that back into what you've experienced around the culture of misconduct, I'd appreciate it greatly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. As an officer, yes, I, I said I saw many different things. You know, I went, I spoke briefly about the extreme of when you have an officer involved shooting and everyone in the room knows that at, at best uh, procedure or policy was violated and at worst it was an actual criminal homicide, okay? And unfortunately I've seen both. How an agency has tried to clean those up is what has troubled me the most. But most of the misconduct isn't something that uh, causes a physical harm to someone. It's usually how they talk to people. It just simply boils down to how an officer talks to someone and that in and of itself is misconduct by the letter of most police agencies because of the rude and insolent behavior that an officer gives. Now, from the community side, um, and, and what makes that difficult to prove is a lot of times from the community side, you know, we'll get a complaint that says an officer was rude. Well, we're fortunate now that we have all of our officers that wear body-worn cameras. So I can look at the camera and see how did the officer talk to the person? How did the person talk to the officer? How did the officer, you know, exchange the driver's license or the paperwork or what, whatever? And then we can try to make some kind of judgment from that. Uh, before the body-worn cameras, unless you had someone that was totally disassociated with the incident, you know, that was just one person's word against another. So what we try to do in Oakland is identify those kind of little behaviors and even if we can't sustain you know I can go back and look at an officer that may have five or six rudeness allegations or separate allegations of rudeness and then go to that supervisor or go to the commander of internal affairs and say hey this officer may have a problem now that brings me to the second part how do we work together that's how we work together I now have a good relationship with the commander of internal affairs and the chief. And we are working now to put into policy certain practices since we all are working together for the day that we're not there. Because when I first got there, the commander of internal affairs was uh, what you would call, she just bled blue. Blue was right and everything else was wrong. And that's why I had to go there with her that, well, you may be a captain, tenured captain, but I am a department head and that outranks you. So do I need to go to your department head to speak to her, or to, at the time, speak to him about your behavior? Now, as a tenured captain, 
she's going to have one of two choices. Well, one of three. Either fix it, she could retire, or she'll be reassigned. They couldn't really discipline a captain. That's kind of how it goes in, in law enforcement. It's more like a tenured professor, you know, certain things they can do. But I could also have that conversation with her, and I could have it in that tone. So now, with the captain that's in place, and the chief that's in place, and the executive staff that's in place, I have their phone numbers, they have mine, and we work well together. And it doesn't diminish my independence as an agency in the decisions I make. Because a lot of times, I can propose something to them of where I'm going with a decision and maybe point out some things that they can agree to. And then that way we still meet what we're trying to do, which is discipline when necessary, correct the behavior, uh, hopefully change the culture, and it doesn't have to be adversarial. And what we want to do is put policies in place so that when we're gone, it's in the general orders that this is how it is to be done so that there's not going to be any question later on. So that would be my legacy to leave uh, whatever time I have left there is to walk away with some actual policy in place that the officers have to adhere to. Thank you, Mr. Fennell. I'm sorry, if we can just move on to the next one. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming. I'm Mary Adams. My question is actually in direct follow-up to that um, regarding the policy uh, in the ways that inter internal affairs or professional standards would interact with independent civilian review boards. Um, I was a witness in a few years ago to a, ser a really severe brutality situation. Actually, it led to the formation of Enough is Enough, um, that case. And I already knew that our professional standards would not do anything with it. I thought that you know it was a useless step to go to them, and instead we're working to bring light to the situation in other ways. Um, but the attorney involved did want me to go to professional standards, so I did. And the situation with that, and people know this, it's not just unique to my experience, it was worse than useless because what they actually do is they cross-examine you for the police defense. And so, I mean, and it was very, very clear that that's what was going on. There was not one sergeant, there were two sergeants who were clearly cross-examining me. Um, and the questions that they asked were clearly aimed at finding small, minute ways to trip up my account, um, which I had no motive to give anything other than the truth. And they were clearly not interested in the misconduct by their officers. So my question is, I mean, o Oakland, I think, may be a unique context in terms of the ability for there to be this, you know, all working together situation. Although I'm skeptical because I know that in Oakland there still are serious problems with police conduct. So can you speak more, I guess, to the policy and to how you would address the systemic issues beyond your ability as a fellow police person to, to speak with the captain? Thank you. Well, in Oakland, many of you may or may not know that Oakland is uh, currently under a negotiated settlement agreement that came out of a lawsuit that was filed almost 15 years ago, 16 years ago, which uh, was a result of a group of officers, a uh, infam infamously, I can't even pronounce it now, infamously uh, known as the Riders. And, and these officers, as you can imagine, they was a unit of officers that went around and planted drugs and arrested people and beat people and did all kinds of abuses until they got a new member to their unit who was a rookie officer and he reported them. Uh, ultimately, that led to several lawsuits, a huge settlement, uh, some convictions, and the leader of the group of the writers has fled to Mexico, last known, and he's yet to be found. But one of the settlement agreements was that there would be some 52 tasks that the Oakland Police Department had to correct, and it would be monitored by a federal judge. So they've been under this for the last 15 or 16 years. So there's a federal monitor, it was a private entity, a private uh, organization, and uh, a compliance officer, and they meet with the police department every month, uh, and they follow these tasks. Now, that is also a catalyst for why the police commission was created, because what was supposed to be three or four years has turned into 15. 
and each year it's a couple million dollars. So you can imagine the expense that the city of Oakland has to pay to do this. Uh, before, and quite frankly, you had a group of officers that had no will to change, even under the federal monitor. So the tasks weren't being completed. They were never in compliance. People have been removed, people have brought in, monitors have been changed over the years. And, but now you have a group in the command level that are really working hard to uh, finalize the NSA, as it's called, and, and, and uh, become cl compliant in the final few tasks so that they can come out from underneath the monitor. But not just for that time period, but there have also instituted policies and, uh, and uh, uh, procedures to maintain the consistency once they uh, come out from under it. And part of that is the police commission and is uh, my agency as part of that process. And really, if you have a uh, professional standards unit, as you described with Rochester, where they're you know, treating people that way and not trying to uh, get to the truth, then that's a, another systemic issue that goes from the top down. And it's, at some point, it may be a combination where you, know, you develop a pattern and practice case and show or uh, the, what's going on in Rochester, or you develop, you know, um, from several people, get their account of the mistreatment they received and put together another type of lawsuit, you know, attack them that way. Because it is going to take a concerted effort on many different fronts. And it might just take, you know, uh, unfortunately during this climate, it's probably not going to happen until we get a new Department of Justice, a uh, new president in. But, that might be the way to go, you know, uh, and really trying to institutionalize what it is you want into the agency. Uh, that way, if it's a violation of that policy, that is another way to deal with, you know, handling that discipline. But if it's not a policy, if it's not written down, if it's not institutionalized, then uh, you can't hold anyone accountable. So it's 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 a multifaceted issue that um, and and. In, Breaking down that culture within the department is going to take a long time. You know, I think the gentleman mentioned something about the hiring. You know, when you got people that don't live in your community, yet they're policing your community, that's an issue. You know, and it goes back to recruiting. Who are you trying to recruit? You know, what, what are your hiring standards? So this problem has to be looked at from all of the different angles, from what you're bringing into the department and who's already there and then how you're holding those folks accountable. And if you look at it like you would a business model, you know, if you want to make this bottle right here, this bottle doesn't hold this water just because somebody threw it together. The right quality materials went in to hold this water.